I was, I was tempted to, to label my talk TBD just as penance for not giving my title in time. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, but, but instead, I, I figured that would doing, be doing you guys a disservice in addition to the, the, the thing on the, on the, uh, in, the, in the program. Um, I, I, so I saw, I saw Hillary's paper for tomorrow, and I thought, I better, I, should, I, I have a paper on this. I could, I could, I could actually like present, be kind of thematic. So, so I'm going to talk about the food purchasing behavior of new SNAP recipients. SNAP, uh, for, for, for the, the old folks in the audience like me, it's, it's food stamps. It's now called uh, uh, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. And if you use the word food stamp in a, in a USDA setting, they get very happy with you. So you, you get with the, every SNAP now, okay? Um, all right, so SNAP is, SNAP is a, it's, it's a key program in the US to smooth nutritional shocks. Um, it, uh, it's, it, uh, it, it's very, very uh, strongly correlated with pre sort of preserving food security, especially in, in, in during recessions and other set of times. There's lots of lots of research uh, that, that suggests that. Um, there's a there's a lot of rigorous work suggesting SNAP improves the health of children, um, uh, including this very very interesting paper. Um, there's there's uh, there's and as a major policy goal uh, uh, it, of, of SNAP is to is to improve nutritional outcomes. Um, and now the uh, some of you may know. Uh, between right at, during the, the steady state level SNAP recipients was about 20 million people. During the Great Recession, there was an enormous increase. Uh, these are data from the 2000, uh, 1998 to, uh, to 2012, or 1997 to 2012 PSID, sort of replicating this this finding that, that, that we did. With basically, went up to about like 45 million people. Um, and uh, that's the end of my data, but uh, but if you look at the, what since 2012, it's it's stayed up up above 45 million since 2016. There's been a decline to about 40 million, right? So there's been a doubling of the SNAP population in a very short period of time, and um, you know at the, at the peak it's like roughly one in six Americans have one on SNAP, right? So it's it's a it's a it's a big deal program. It might, it might even be the the most populated. Uh, sort of transfer program, uh, federal transfer program that exists. Maybe Medicaid. Oh, okay. Medicaid has 75 million people. That's Medicaid, yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's still, it's a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> like, I should know better than the state of the country. Okay, so, um, uh, okay, so now I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend, I'm, I have, um, I have five slides trying to motivate why you should care about my question. Um, and I realized I put the question after at the end. Uh, so before, before I do the five slides motivating you guys, um, if you don't like one motivation, there's four others, so just, just hold on. Um, so the question is this. Are the new SNAP recipients, the doubling of the SNAP population, are they different? Like, in, in what ways are they different from the, the, the traditional existing SNAP population that came in the pre-2008 era? Uh, now, why might you care about that? That's what these five slides are about, all right? So we'll, we'll, we'll see how you guys can tell me if any of these work or don't work. Um, uh, so the first, uh, the first but not necessarily the most important, is that the new SNAP recipients may perceive welfare stigma very differently than the existing SNAP recipients, right? That's, and there's a literature uh, going back to, well, even before Bob Moffitt, but that, that's sort of the, 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 the paper I always think about when I think about welfare stigma. And there's, there's, there's stuff specific to SNAP in the, in, uh, this, this interesting paper on Manchester and Mumford. The, the, the key uh, thing to remember, though, about SNAP is that it's no longer actually a food stamp, right? So mo for most people, when they buy, uh, when they use the SNAP program, they have a card, an EBT card. By the way, who's, who, who knows what EBT is? Electronic. Oh, no, you're Hillary, you don't count. You're not allowed to say, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so e e EBT, so it's basically, if you, you'll see, if you go to like a 7-Eleven, like I'm, I, I often do, and you'll see the EBT, it's essentially they're saying you can use your credit card-like thing, uh, and it won't look like a like you're, you're bringing out a, a, a special food stamp or something. It doesn't look like a food stamp. So yeah, I, I think that's addressed a lot of the welfare stigma issues. But still, if you're a, 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 someone who's not used to being on these kind of welfare programs, and all of a sudden you're, uh, the Great Recession happens, you're on one, you might face welfare stigma very different. You might you have a very different view of welfare stigma than people who have been on it for a long, longer time. Um, okay, so second, uh, the, the 96 welfare reform imposed a three, three month time limit on SNAP enrollment within any three year period for those not working. Right? So it's, it's a pretty, pretty tight time limit. 
Um, those time limits actually during recessions get, get relaxed, and a lot of states actually did relax them. Right? And so, uh, so and, and in particular, it excludes children, elderly, and disabled. Um, and so, so, so these, these, and these, more than that. Yeah. It's really only childless people. This is it just childless people? Yeah. So, it's, <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the point is that the, uh, the recession group might differ from the people that were there before, right? So there's, a, there's, there's motivation number two. You guys feeling motivated? Do I need to go to five slides? I, I may as well, I have them. Um, so here's, here's slide three. Um, uh, new, new recipients might have more difficulty planning uh, about how to, how to manage the, 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 the dispersal timing. So for instance, there's, a, there's this fantastic paper by, by Mel Steffens uh, called, called Third of the Month. Anyone, anyone ever read that paper? It's a fantastic paper. Basically, uh, the idea is that uh, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the uh, dispersal of time, the, 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 the benefits are given on the third of the month, and then uh, you, have to, you have to sort of make do with that, that benefit level until the next third of the month. And what he shows is that during the fourth week of the month, people sort of run short. Right? They didn't plan exactly right, and they, they sort of run short. Um, and it's possible uh, that the, the new recipients will have more difficulty than the old recipients because they're not used to dealing with the sort of dispersal timing that, they, that, they, that, uh, that are in some of these programs in some of these states. Um, fourth, uh, the new recipients uh, might have different knowledge about their diets, health diets. Uh, I mean, and of course, they could run in either direction. They could be either, either better at it or worse at it. We just don't know. Uh, why is this important? Because well, it's five. There, there's a there's a um, uh, there, there's like policies aimed within SNAP to try to get people to ha have better diets, right? So if uh, if they if they're used to different kinds of diets, the policies that work in the old groups may not work in the new groups, right? So we kind of want to know. At least I want to know why these people are different. Are right, you guys motivated? I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm pumped. I want to know the answer. Um, but but uh, the, the only thing I, I should, I should now that I've got you all pumped up, I, I should. I, you haven't got done that, done the job. But uh, but I, the, the key, the thing is, is that I'm only going to give you really a descriptive analysis. Uh, I, I think that's but, but, but actually it's kind of an interesting descriptive analysis. There ought to be more descriptive analysis in economics. Um, so here, so the research question. So how do how do new SNAP recipients differ, in particular, on demographics? food security, and the nutritional content of food purchases. Um, this one turns out to be the, really the hardest thing, um, for, for reasons I'll tell you, because there's not, the, the data sets to do it are, are, are difficult. Um, uh, difficult to deal with. So the, 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 the first, uh, so the first data set I'm gonna use is the PSID, right? the Panel Study of Income Dynamics. It's an annual, long-term, longitudinal thing that goes back uh, to the 60s, I think. Uh, you, the, the way, you know, you guys know the way it works, right? You, you get on the PSID, you have the PSID, Gene. If you have if you have kids, they have a PSID <laughs> gene, and then they're and they're they're followed on for the rest of their life. You marry somebody, they get the PSID gene until you divorce them. Then they stop having the PSID gene, and then you, you get it anyway. So it's it's a it's a, fantastic, it's a great data source. Um, uh, it's it's a uh, and one nice thing about this is because it's longitudinal, you can you can identify whether the person is on SNAP for the first first time ever, right? At least going back to the '97 when we looked at. Right, so that's what we do. Is we just basically look at the look at the uh, PSID in a longitudinal way, and and we say, okay, if you're if you join SNAP now this year, that's like 2008, and you've never been on SNAP back to 1997, the first year you're on SNAP is your you're new, and then after that you're an existing SNAP recipient. Uh, if you're if there's a gap where you used to be on SNAP, we still count you as an existing if you go if you rejoin. Right, so. You only you can only be new once, and if you're never on SNAP, you're a never SNAP. So there's it's a three mutually exclusive groups. There's you're either new, uh, right? So so you're either new, existing, or never. That's uh, okay. So now I'm going to spend most of the time just going through some some like descriptive statistics, which is actually I think the most, most the, fun, the fun part. Actually, I didn't even got to the fun part, but, but this is fun. Okay, so um. Uh, how the, so uh, here are the three groups, never, new, and existing. And this is just the difference in the characteristic between the never and the existing, all right? So uh, they're, they're, the, the new, so a positive number means more in the new, a negative number means more in the, in the, uh, in the existing population. So these are like the 20 million that started, and these are the new extra 25 million that were added on. And these are just adults, they're not uh, so we have some on kids, but these are just for, let's see. By the mean age, it looks like they're probably 
has a kid's thing. Oh, it's in the food. Okay, I'll have kids in food apps. Okay. Uh, actually, we, we have a table. I, I already have too many tables. So I have I have something with kids, but you can bring it. Bring it. Um, okay. So uh, the new the new folks who added on were more likely to be male. This like in, in, in terms of individual, like about six percentage points. Thirty seven percent used to be in the existing, and then forty three percent male in the in the in the new ones. Uh, the, uh, they, they are less likely to, to have dropped out of high school. Right? They're less like seven percentage points, which is actually a pretty significant, significant thing. So more likely to be male, less likely to have dropped out of high school. Um, they're more likely to be actually employed. Right? So, and, and that's not surprising given that the, the, a lot of them are, have to now have work requirements. The, the relaxation of the SNAP benefit work requirements has sort of ended uh, as, the, as the Great Recession has, sort of, uh, has faded into the past. Um, and fewer of them are not, not looking for work. Right? But, so they're, they're, they're more employed, they're less likely to be drop, high school dropouts, and more likely to be male, right, the new, the new SNAP recipients. Um, they are about the same age, even though statistically significant doesn't mean much. Um, they're more likely to be white, significantly more likely to be white, than, than, the, uh, than the, the, the existing SNAP recipients, 11 percentage points, um, less likely to be black. That's almost all the, 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 the so there's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a more white population, more educated population. Uh, they're more likely to be married. Essentially, you, you're starting to get a picture, at least the picture I'm getting is that they're more like the middle class population, right? uh, which is not surprising, so digging deeper into the, the distribution. Um, they, now, these family income differences are huge. If you look at the never SNAP recipients, now partly this is because they have uh, larger families, the never SNAP recipients, the more intact families. Um, but uh, the, as far as like the income, there's a slight income difference between the new and the existing in the, in the favor of the, the new. The new people tend to be a little bit richer. Uh, also, the, the, they're 14% more likely to own a home. 6% um, less likely to live in public housing, 11% like, less likely to not own a car, right? So they, they're more likely to live in a, they, they're more likely to have stuff. Like they're, they're looking more like a middle class family. They're, they're, but they're not, but actually it's kind of interesting to compare them against, um, for instance, on this basis against nevers, right? Nevers are very unlikely to not own a car. Whereas the, the, they're like, they're in between, right? They're the, they're the middle class that's in between. Um, the, the, the more, more likely married, so it's not surprising that the more likely they have spouses present, um, uh, but they're also less likely to be ch childless, right? So this is, this is why, why Hillary asked about children. So this, is, this is a, uh, a, a, a population of kids who are not traditionally on welfare, uh, but, but, uh, but, are, but are like moved into it in the 2008 recession, uh, and slightly more likely to be English speaking, not much. It's in, again in between, uh, never in existence. Okay, so the problem with what's the problem with PSID? The nutritional outcomes of PSID are like minimal. I, I mean, it's a fantastic data set for some things, but I can't I can't say very much about uh, about food. And I, I kind of want to say something about food. I, I just enough to say just because they're on SNAP doesn't tell you much about the nutrition. And, and that and all of the policy motivations have to do with what are the nutritional outcomes. So the the idea that uh, we had was to use this data set that the USDA collects called the Food Apps Program, the Food Apps data. Uh, food apps is is a, is a program where the, the FDA will come and give you a long survey that will assess uh, how how good is your diet. Uh, they'll ask you like a dietary 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 recall. Uh, they'll, they'll 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 also connect to uh, your your food purchasing behavior from uh, from supermarket scanners. Right? If you, you guys ever have a anyone have a card? That, that you that you use whenever you go like my wife forces me to scan the thing and then they they have all my information including all the cookies I bought. I mean, so they, you, just, you just scan the thing, and then literally there's a database filled with all every single purchase that you've made, like dollars. And then the, the, the USDA has a way to, to basically, they, they, they have like a database of food labels uh, that they use to assess what the calorie content of the, the food purchases you have are. Right? So, and not just calories, but like fat, uh, for purchases, you know, just you name it. There's like all kinds of nutritional information in, uh, available. It's just it's a fantastic data set for uh, the richness of data it has about food. The major problem with the food apps is that very, very much unlike the PSID, there's a it's a single cross section. Um, and not only is it a single cross section, 
It doesn't have any information whatsoever about whether you're a new food stamp recipient, new, new SNAP recipient. It just, all, the only thing it says is, are you a SNAP recipient? It doesn't say if you are also, a, 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 if, if it's the first time you've ever signed on in the last year, which, is what I, which I thought it had when we first proposed the thing, and then, then they, it didn't have that. So, okay, so how do I, so what do we do? So we, what we uh, well, let me, let me just run you through the, the, the characteristics and then I'll tell you what we did to, to sort of address this. Um, okay, uh, these characteristics are not that interesting given what I've already showed you. What can I show you? Right, so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna just jump to these. The, oh, I know why I put these that slides here. These, these characteristics are all, the, the, the dem demographic characteristics are similar to what's available in the PSID. Right, it's actually a pretty good demographic survey. Right, so this was the idea for what to do about, the, about this. So um, the, the food stamp, the food apps doesn't distinguish between new SNAP recipients and the existing SNAP recipients. Uh, but I have a whole set of demographics that match exactly what's available in the PSID. And the PSID, I can tell you if they're new or existing or, or, or never SNAP recipients. Um, so what's the idea? Use the PSID to create a classifier, a predictor function conditional on all these X's for whether or not they're a new, existing, or, or, uh, or never SNAP recipient. And then apply the classifier to the food apps data and say, okay, are they likely to have been a SNAP recipient or not? Uh, are, are they likely to have been new or not, right? Um, okay, so uh, this led to some fun. Uh, we, had a, we, we, we estimated a multinomial logit model. Um, the right-hand side variables, though, we, we I mean, I actually don't, there are like 10 demographic variables you focused on, like age, household size, income, education, race, ethnicity, and so on. Um, I, I don't know what the right functional form is. And, and so, and, and, I'm, and I'm sitting at Stanford, and there are all these people talking about machine learning algorithms, so I'm like, okay, I gotta, I gotta try it. So we did this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, basically, what we, it's a very, very simple kind of idea, this, this lasso thing. All, all we did is I, I took the 10 variables, I, I, I dumbified everything. <laughs> You just uh, it's all every it's like a complete set of indicator variables. I can I can, you can and then and then I took all of the, of the set of the full set of interactions, uh, pairwise interactions between the two. So if there were like uh, thirty seven dumbified variables, there would have been six hundred and sixty six pairwise interactions. You can you can do the math. You're, if, I mean, if you have a calculator, thirty seven choose two is turns out to be six six. Uh, whatever, it doesn't matter. The point is that we have we done we we have this like ridiculous set of interaction terms. Um, that, that we put into each arm of this multinomial logic, right? So there's 1,200 1, variables in the multinomial. It's too many, right? Um, uh, so what we did is we, we, we did a, like a, a, a lasso variant. But lasso, you guys know what a lasso does, right? So a lasso, it's, it's like a regression. It, the, the objective function for a lasso is, is, is just like for a regression, except there's a penalty for the, 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 the sum of all the, the coefficients multiplied by some 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 uh, some some uh, you know some some lambda that you you, uh, you set yourself some penalty factor, right? So it penalizes you for having um, having a bunch of, of too many terms in the regression, and it picks which terms like sort of best predict in this L1 norm kind of penalty sense, right? So it's just it's, there's a there's standard algorithms now and the, and it was it was great fun to like adapt them to this to this this multinomial logic and and it's. Uh, I mean, I, like, if you're if you're going to ask me, is there any economics in this? There's the answer is no. There's there's none. I'm just using this as a classifier, all right? So Darius, I can already hear him yelling at me. Um, uh, you, you were going to yell at me, right, Darius? Not at all. Oh. Okay. So so anyway, so we got uh, how well did this do? Um, <laughs> too much, but it's even worse. Um, so the. the, uh, the <laughs> The, so how well did this do? So um, I can't tell you in, in the food apps how well it actually did in terms of saying whether they're new or existing, because in the food apps, I don't see if they're new or existing. However, I can tell you how well it did relative to, can it predict whether they're, 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 they're on, food, uh, on SNAP or not in the food apps, right? And, and there I can just construct a, 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 an ROC curve. So this is like, a, I think this is like I, I said that they're on food stand uh, on SNAP, but they're not. And here I said that they're not on SNAP, but they are. That kind of that kind of thing. And depending on where I set the threshold for the classifier, I'm going to draw out this uh, receiver operator curve. And um, if it would be a perfect classifier if this was uh, a square, right? 
if it, if it, if it hit, hit, there'd be no error on either side. Um, and it's actually, as far as like predicting whether they're on snap or not on snap, is pretty good. Like the, the, the receiver, the area under the ROC curve is about 0.8, which is, you know, one would have been perfect. Um, it's not that. I, I, unfortunately, I can't, I, can't spe I can't tell you what the error looks like as far as predicting existing, uh, existing versus new, but it's, it's, you know, it is what it is. Okay, so we do all this ridiculous stuff to get these three numbers, right? So we have three numbers for, for uh, conditional, because we observe the same X's in the food apps and the PSID, we can just basically take the model we make in the PSID and estimate the three, the three probabilities of being on, on never snap, new snap, and existing snap in the food apps data itself, right? For each, each, each person to think conditional on all these covariates, uh, all dumbified out and then selected based on the lasso. Um, and then, uh, oh God, this was horrible. Uh, we, we, we standard errors. I have no idea how to do standard errors in this set. I was so, I was so, I'm like, so, so I just whatever I do, whenever I run into that, I just say let's just do the bootstrap and hope for the best. Um, I, I'm sure the econometricians are in the room are, 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 are grimacing. Um, you guys are grimacing. Right? You guys will tell me what, if I did this horribly wrong. So like basically, um, what we did is we we uh, bootstrapping the lasso. If you bootstrap the coefficients, it's actually funny because. Uh, it's selecting out, essentially just putting zeros on a whole bunch of the coefficients, right? So essentially that's what Bootstrap does. It zeros out a bunch of the terms. So you don't actually have 666 terms, you have many fewer. So what I, I, didn't, I just didn't bother with the bootstrap, the, 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 the regression terms. I, instead I bootstrapped the probabilities, right? So these P's I have a bootstrap. Um, and then for each, so we did 50 bootstraps on the PSID and for each bootstrap we did 50 bootstraps on the food apps. 50 times 50, so 2,500. <laughs> bootstraps for the whole thing. And the problem was the food, the food apps is in this like secure server environment somewhere deep in the bowels of the USDA that we can only access via, I mean, my RA had to get blood every time he get, no, something like that. It was, it was awful. Um, you know, he had to call in somewhere and then they would call him back and it was just, it was a long, a long process to like do anything. And then there wasn't the software we wanted on there to do this. And so it was just, it was a, it was a hugely long and, 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 and cumbersome process to get this to work. So I'm kind of happy that it worked and I'm really hoping the econometricians tell me this is okay. Um, Cause I don't want to redo this. Okay. Um, uh, so, all right, I don't apologize. Let me, let me just show you the results. Um, the way to think about this, these results is uh, this line, the zero is the, is the new recipients. And I just I, I could focus on the, the comparisons with the exist with the with the never recipients, but they're just they just look very different. I, I want I, that's not really a policy interesting thing. The policy interesting are these triangle people. The triangles are the existing, right? So, uh, for instance, uh, the BMI of the existing versus the new SNAP recipients is basically the same, right? There's no there's no difference in, in body weight. Uh, the uh, probability of, of smoking. <coughs> massive standard error for some reason is, is basically the same for the new and SNAP recipients. Uh, the, 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 the existing SNAP recipients are less likely to report excellent health status. Right? So the, ex, the, the ones that the, the, the original 20 million are, are more likely to be, are less likely to be in excellent health status than the new 25 million. Um, Okay, so here's, here's why we use food apps for things like this. So that there's a dietary survey that asks, did you eat all three meals in a day? So like this is, this is one of these things, like it's, it's essentially a food security measure, right? So they'll ask people, uh, did you skip a meal? And usually they'll, 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 follow on with like, they'll, they'll follow on with like, did you skip a meal because you're dieting? And they'll, they'll remove those and just ask you, did you skip a meal because, because of money? Right, so it's a, it's a question like that. And turns out that, which is sort of an unexpected result, the existing SNAP recipients are less likely to have skipped a meal. Or, or I'm sorry, are less, I guess that's not so surprising. They're, they're, they're less likely to have eaten all three meals. They're more likely to be food insecure than the new ones. And this is a random poly for all those differences that you Yeah, about. although it's a little funny because by these measures themselves, the classifiers are based on those. So right. yeah, so it's, 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 a, it's a, I mean, I, so we have versions of this where we did and did not control and we get the same or, or similar kinds of things. And the way we did the controls, we didn't control them in the dumbified way, we controlled them in the, the more traditional way in these regressions. Otherwise, if I put up the full dummy set, this wouldn't have been identified. Okay. Uh, 
here's child health outcomes. So um, the existing SNAP recipients have, uh, are more likely to have kids that have a high BMI or, or obese or higher BMI, right? Uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, but it's not a huge effect. This is like linear, BM, this is linear regression of BMI, so 0.14 BMI points is, is not an enormous, enormous difference. So they look roughly the same on BMI. Um, uh, the, uh, the other thing is the existing SNAP recipients are, are actually, their kids are more likely to have eaten all three meals than the new SNAP recipients. So it's opposite from what, the, what you saw with the adults. Right? So with the adults, uh, the triangles was to the, was, was, uh, was to the left, and uh, this for the eight, all three meals, and for the kids is to the right. right? So there's a, there's a difference in how uh, kids' outcomes versus adult outcomes for the new versus existing SNAP recipients. All right, so uh, this is health and, and, and nutrition intake. Um, okay, so all of these are, are all of these numbers. These are like daily energy in kilocalories, daily carbs and grams, daily sugar in grams, and total fat intake. Um, but they're all to the right for these these triangles, meaning, meaning that the existing SNAP recipients buy more calories than the new ones. But these are tiny, tiny, tiny numbers, right? So they really are actually. I mean, I thought I, I, they really are like 0.23 calories per day. It's like it's just basically, even though it's significant, it's not. There's no difference really there. Um, they're eating the same, as far as like these measures of diet are concerned, the same, the same diet. And you can see this in the HEI score. The HEI score is an overall index that the USDA has created to to score how good the diet people have are. And it's basically exactly the same for the new and existing staff recipients. Um, uh, okay, so uh, food at home, food away from home. FDA said does uh, USDA kind of thing. So FAFH is food away from home. FAH is food at home. Um, the uh, percent of food away from home events that were fast food is lower for the existing than for the new. The new are more likely to be going to fast food when they go out. Um, but the percent of energy from food away, food at home is higher for the, uh, for the, for the, the, for the existing. Uh, alcohol consumption is more for the existing than for the new. Right? So just, but it's not, again, not an enormous amount. It's like 1.6 1, 1. grams per day. Here's the data. Yep. Do you think it's weird that the numbers in the existing look so uh, I mean, there, there's, there's, see, there, there's some places where they, where there, there are like some differences, like here, uh, but they're, frankly, like these, I, I, I actually view this as like a, as a, as a vindication of the SNAP program. In some sense, it, it people on the SNAP program essentially have mainstream looking diets, then at least on these bases. Uh, com compared to like it's 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 actually in some ways very unlike the, the what we heard earlier from Tom Tom Rice about about uh, about uh, health insurance right they're, they're, this is a very different kind of thing that actually does promote equality. Um, okay, uh, let's see. We did child health. We did this. Um, that's this one. This uh, food food insecurity is really interesting. So the existing people, existing SNAP recipients are le are less likely to report food uh, high food in, high food security and, uh, compared to the new. So the food the new people are less likely to be food insecure, right? So food insecure, I go to bed without eating eating dinner, right? I skip meals because I can't afford to eat. Uh, the new ones are less likely to be food insecure. Uh, oh, this one's really fun. So total driving distance from home to food away from home events, like who who drives more? To go out to eat, and it turns out it's actually uh, SNAP, uh, ex uh, existing SNAP recipients more than the new ones. The new ones stay at home, All right? So the, just imagine this picture of this, this middle class family down on their luck because of the 2008 recession. All of a sudden, they used to go out to eat, and now they're no longer going out to eat. Right? That's that's the picture this is painting. Um, all right, uh, where do they live? The existing SNAP recipients actually live, uh, are less likely to have a fast food restaurant within a mile of their house. So the new ones live closer to fast food restaurants, but they're not going to them. Um, 
do they are, are there are there grocery stores nearby? Well, this is only marginally significant, but the existing fat SNAP recipients are more likely um, are, are, are more likely to live further away from a from a supermarket, basically. And then um, total expenditures on food food at home less for the SNAP the existing SNAP recipients. Total expenditures on food away from home is about the same for, for, for uh, even though they, they go out less, they probably spend more when they go out, the new ones. And then uh, here's the number of times they go out. The household goes out for dinner, it's more for the existing than for the new. And, uh, the num and, and conversely, the number of times prepared food at home for dinner is less for the existing than for the new. And then uh, the number of times the family ate the meal together is the same for the existing, new, and never which is actually kind of heartening. Okay, um, I mean, I don't know, unless they, they yell and argue with each other at the table or something, but that could happen, I guess. All right, um, what, how much time am I, how am I doing? Oh, I got five minutes, oh, well, I'm almost done. Um, so let, I just, let me just, I, I, I gave you too many results, so let me, I, just, I just like pulled them together to summarize them. Um, so compared with existing SNAP recipients, new recipients are, have higher, high, are more likely or have higher probability to have excellent health status, that for their kids, they're more likely to skip meals. They're, they are uh, more likely to eat fast food when eating away from home, but they're less likely to eat fast food. Um, they're more likely to spend money on food, food at home. They live close to fast food restaurants. Um, they, they, uh, they live close to SNAP authorized retailers, uh, and, but they, they don't go out. They, then the, the number of food at home events, not food away from home events, they, is, is higher for the the new, the, the, the new recipients, right? So the, the picture is they're eating at home. Um, they're, 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 uh, the, the, only, the only weird result to me is this one, the skip meals, because it, it's like the, the kids are not, they're, they're not protecting their kids from the, the, the they're not using the, 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 the SNAP uh, things. To, they're less likely to use the SNAP resources to protect their kids from, from skipping meals. Um, okay, no difference. Uh, in healthy eating index, no difference in distance to the supermarket, no difference in spending a, a food at home, and no difference in times eating together as a family. And then uh, less and lower probability of uh, skipping meals for the adults. There are less or lower probability of having high BMI kids, lower probability of, of purchasing natural routines. I should have put this in the equal category because even though these are significant, like I said, they're eating the same, essentially the same. Um, the, they're less likely to have out, purchase alcohol, and they're less likely to dri have drive far away for food away from home events. They, they eat out less. Okay, so wh where do we look? What, what's, the, what's the bottom line? I think that the, the new SNAP recipients resemble the existing SNAP recipients in the demographics and broadly in the food purchasing behavior. Right? So this concern, the, all this motivation, those motivation slides, are answered by saying that it, it's, it's probably not as a big a deal as you might think it would have been that the 20 to 25 million people are actually very, very similar to the, the, the old 20 million people. Um, there's no evidence consistent with the hypothesis that new SNAP recipients have additional difficulty managing the intricacies of the program. I mean, they, they're, they're eating calories and purchasing calories of roughly the same amounts as the, uh, so, and so, I, so there's, there's no evidence consistent with additional <coughs> uh, So and in a sense, I mean, I'm actually, I'm kind of heartened by this. I mean, I was expecting a very different set of results. I was expecting to find uh, much more difficulty, much more evidence for the new SNAP recipients to have difficulty find, get, you know, so purchasing food, have more difficulty managing the program. But it seems like a lot of the efforts that have been undertaken to, to reduce stigma and, and, and sort of mainstream SNAP recipiency have, have succeeded. Uh, and it, and it, even in the face of a doubling or more than a doubling of the program's uh, load. Okay, well, that's all I have. I should disclose my conflict of interest, which is Jay and I have been friends for like a million years. Uh, and I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a little story that uh, oh God. Jay, uh, <laughs> uh, we met almost 19 years ago at the AEA meetings. Jay was one of the people interviewing me for a job at RAND. And a uh, little known fact is that Jay was literally the only person in the entire organization that wanted to fly me out. And the rest is history. That's so the best decision one, one year later, Jay uh, left Rand, skipped town, and fled north. So you can decide how that decision worked out for him in, in the end. But I'd like to um, talk a little bit about a couple of aspects of Jay's paper that I think he undersold. And I think there is a, lot, a fair amount of economics in this paper that's pretty intuitive. 
and quite interesting. Um, and I wanted to uh, kind of go through some of the uh, motivational issues associated with them, um, and then highlight a couple of interesting empirical findings that I think are worth further discussion. So uh, the key issue in this paper is uh, Jay's interested in comparing, his co-authors are interested in comparing marginal SNAP recipients to the incumbent SNAP recipients. So that's actually a, a first-order basic economic question. How do marginal returns uh, vary from average returns? Um, so he's providing some insight into this question of uh, what's, the, what's the return to expanding programs, essentially. Right? This is a way of, of thinking about um, the issue to an extent. The problem is, uh, as outlined in the talk and the paper, is that there's no data source that gives us a lot of detailed information on uh, nutrition and health um, and SNAP uh, eligibility and SNAP status. So that's why we have this approach of using the PSID um, along with the, uh, the food apps uh, data. So uh, I won't uh, spend a lot of time summarizing this because Jay was very clear, uh, as always. Uh, but the basic uh, point is that, first of all, we use the PSID data to figure out the probability of SNAP um, status using a set of demographic variables that show up in the food apps. Uh, and then we take those kind of predicted propensities to be um, SNAP recipients uh, to the food apps data, um, and we study the relationship between um, SNAP status and detailed measures of food and nutrition. So uh, let me, I'm going to summarize the results a little differently um, than Jay did. And I'm actually going to, Seth made this point, um, and I think it's an interesting one. I think it's a feature, not a bug, by the way. I don't think it's a problem necessarily with the paper. It's quite interesting that in terms of food consumption, existing recipients and never recipients are more similar to each other than new recipients, which is quite interesting uh, and intriguing because you would assume uh, that uh, there should be this kind of monotonic relationship where the existing SNAP recipients um, are, let's say, the lowest SES, the marginal recipients have the next lowest SES or the middle SES, and the never recipients have the highest SES. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my kind of half-baked uh, um, hypotheses about why this is happening and maybe point towards some uh, future analyses that get at this. Now, it's also worth noting that the story is going to be a little complicated because while uh, the relationship between food and SNAP recipiency is, has a sort of non-monotonic uh, shape. Health, it varies pretty much as expected. Right? That the, the, the uh, new SNAP recipients are healthier than the incumbents, and they're less healthy than the never SNAP recipients. So it's not just a simple story of saying, uh, well, there's something different about the new SNAP recipients and their their. Uh, they're not, um, their SES does not vary as expected. In fact, it probably does. Their health and their SES probably vary as, do vary as expected. But there's something else going on um, with food intake. So I think that there are um, two, at least two contributions to the paper. One is that um, there's a new strategy for thinking about uh, the relationship between um, SNAP recipiency and detailed food consumption <coughs> by exploiting the kind of intersection between these two data sets, the PSID uh, and the food apps. I think it also raises some intriguing questions about um, uh, the effect of SNAP. I'm kind of straying into causality here, but I think that there may be some interesting causal questions that underlie um, what we're seeing in these patterns um, about the effect of SNAP on food consumption patterns at the margin. Okay, and whether those marginal SNAP recipients, in fact, uh, are experiencing either a different effect or maybe they're just different kinds of people um, than the incumbents. So let me uh, say one thing about the first part of this, which is the, the issue of how you do the, um, of how, how the imputation method is done. I actually thought it would be useful. Uh, I, I looked at the PSID code book. Uh, which was super fun, I guess. Um, and uh, it turns out there is <laughs> it turns out there is one there is one variable you might be interested in, which is food expenditures um, in the PSID. And I thought it would be interesting um, for a couple of reasons to conduct an analysis of the sort you're doing, but just with the food expenditure variable. And so you can do a couple things. First, a simple thing, which is to triangulate the PSID only analysis of SNAP recipiency on food expenditures against this sort of impu imputed um, uh, propensity for SNAP recipiency and, and just food expenditures and food apps. That's, that's issue number 
number one, I think, would be um, uh, quite interesting. Um, another point here is that uh, I think you can potentially use the PSID food expenditure data to look at changes in food expenditure. Because um, one of the things I was wondering about was, are the marginal SNAP recipients just getting kind of an income transfer, um, or are they actually increasing their food consumption? Uh, and that's uh, that would be kind of cool, because you can see whether, in fact, um, the kind of dis the split between uh, sort of the crowd out effect, quote unquote, or the pure income transfer effect versus the increase in food consumption effect varies between the incumbents or the uh, marginal recipients. Um, the other thing I would do, just as a matter of you know dealing with annoying referees, is that it's useful to specifically document, I think, the gaps in the literature on how SNAP influences detailed food consumption. Because that's ultimately the, the, the case for needing to do what you're doing in this paper. So I think that's a, I mean, everybody can say, well, it's, it's, it's tragic that you don't have uh, SNAP recipients seeing nutrition in the same data set. Well, that's fine. It's a fine complaint. Uh, but demonstrating what the value of this imputation method is can be helpful. I think that there are some, there probably isn't a lot of literature, to my knowledge, um, on this set of questions, that we, and, and this would be a worthwhile thing to try. Now, let me go to this other issue of um, this non-monotonicity in food consumption, which was really, uh, I spent a lot of time just uh, staring at that and scratching my chin. It's sort of interesting. So uh, let me propose a couple of hypotheses and what you can do. So as I mentioned, in terms of health, uh, everything looks kind of what, as you'd expect. The never SNAP people are the healthiest, and the marginal SNAP, and then the existing SNAP. Uh, but in terms of food at home consumption, I should have clarified that. It's the food at home uh, <coughs> part of this um, data. The new SNAP consumption is lower than the never SNAP and the existing SNAP. So you have this sort of like U-shaped situation for um, food at home consumption. So why is there the non monotonicity So let me give you just, uh, there. I think there are potentially a lot of explanations along these lines. But the basic point is that food is, of course, a derived demand. So the real question is, if you think about the goods that underlie the derived demand for food, they may actually have opposed relationships with income. So here's an example. Um, so you might think of, of uh, food as being a derived demand uh, based on three underlying goods. Leisure time, tastiness of food, <laughs> or something like that, and health. Okay, so let's assume all of these three things are normal goods, um, standard normal goods. So you might uh, reasonably predict that richer people will demand less food at home because um, of their higher demands for leisure, let's say. Okay, that's one possibility. You might also say richer people might demand more food at home because of higher demands for health, under the assumption that food at home is healthier than uh, going to restaurants, um, which is probably, I think is, you can make a good case for that. Now note if both these things are true, it actually likely creates a non-monotonicity in the relationship between income and food. Because basically, you have these two effects uh, that have different signs, and when mixed together, um, you might end up with a sort of like funky new shape situation. So <coughs> I don't know exactly what a perfect strategy is for figuring this out. But one, kind of, I think the general point is, you might get at this if you have an experiment of some kind where you're mitigating one of these two things. So for instance, when you mitigate the demand for leisure time, can you make this relationship more monotonic? Because you're taking away one of the things that's kind of creating this U-shaped um, effect. For instance, uh, you know, this is a very simple analysis and we can refine it, uh, but suppose you focused only on households with a non-working adult. Okay, and there are lots of reasons that you might think that's problematic, which is as a first pass, Let's think about households where um, the demand for leisure time uh, is uh, less of a factor. Um, does, in this subsample, do we see that the new SNAP group still consumes more fast food um, and less food away from home? There may be other ways of doing this as well. In fact, I'm sure there are about 100 other ways of doing this as well. But the basic point is that you can get at this by conducting sub-analyses that weaken 
um, one of these things, either the demand for leisure or the demand for health. I, mean, you, I also thought about doing something like looking only at smokers, but that's sort of funky. But, if you, but the idea would be that you're kind of conditioning on a level of demand for health or demand for bad health in that circumstance. So uh, the last thing I'll say uh, is, um, so since I was a signatory to the Geneva Convention for Economic Discussants, I have to talk about causal inference at least for 30 seconds. Um, which is to say, but I will say first of all, the paper was quite interesting. It's quite an interesting paper um, as a descriptive exercise. Um, I think though that one of the things that I, that I think would be useful with the PSID only analysis is that you can begin to study things like um, what happened during the Great Recession when people were literally treated by the program newly. Okay, so if you look at the people who were, who were, who were kind of treated by SNAP because of the Great Recession, and then you look at those people maybe who um, were untreated by SNAP when the, the economy improved, I think analyzing what happened in their food consumption before and after their entry into the program could be quite in interesting. And thinking about some of the causal effects of changes in income due to job loss, um, you'd have to deal with a host of issues associated with other things changing when people lose their jobs. Uh, but it's a very relevant policy question, the question of what happens to people as you trace out the impact of job loss um, on uh, their food consumption and their health. I mean, there's, you know, Chris Room has a cottage industry and what happens when, uh, to people's health when um, jobs, jobs get lost or recessions occur. And I think that's because it's a, it's a first order important question for policy. So I think uh, overall this was a really stimulating paper. I enjoyed reading it. Um, I enjoyed listening to Jay give ta his talk because he's, let's face it, he's hilarious when he gives talks. <laughs> um, so I, I, was, uh, I, was, I was lucky to be asked to do this. And, and um, uh, thank you again, Rebecca, for asking me to participate. Thank you. <laughs> no, thanks, guys. Those are, those are good suggestions. I don't know how I would solve that, do that, do the, uh, the, the power of inference for me. Uh, that's, 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 you want to work on it? I'd love to. Especially since you now know the PSID so well. <laughs> I get the code book ready. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, just, I was thinking, I'm wondering about your thoughts on as sort of lean towards participation goes back to towards pre recession levels, why the drop off the. Yeah, I, mean, I think, I think the uh, unemployment rates come down, but the, yeah. the lean towards participation rates are still, still like. Yeah, they're still very, so historically high. Right. Um, but, uh, but it hasn't, it only seems like there's like 5 million drop. Yeah, no, I, I, I think. Like, um, I think a lot of those folks have stayed out of the way. Mm -hmm. so, do you know do you know do that? I think that's part of it. I think, you know, one of the things that I wanted to offer you to think a little bit more about is that there actually were policy change. Like at the first graph you showed us with the run up of the food stamp caseload, if you were paying attention, it went up before the Great Recession. Mm -hmm. So this is not just a story about the Great Recession. And there was important policy changes in the early 2000s that you know, essentially really did mechanically expand the program to people slightly more advantaged. And part of that was explicit relaxation of the income and asset requirements. So the results you found for assets were very consistent with the kind of mechanical effect of the changes that states <coughs> could and many did adopt, as well as income um, expansions. Um, but additionally, states really went to this kind of modernizing the food stamp program to try to reach people who are not just the pers persistently poor non-working individuals. Things like being able to sign up online and not having to go in the office. And so you really saw this sort of, sea change is too strong a word, but a place where the sort of fixed costs of going and signing up for food stamps came down. So you saw take up rates go up. You saw many more employed people. It really kind of converted more from the non-working poor to being more about the working poor. So I think even <coughs> absent the Great Recession, I would assert, and I think it's testable, at least in the PSID, that the patterns predate the Great Recession in terms of who the marginal entrants are. Right, so the picture you're painting is, is that uh, the, the, the program changes that made it possible for the expansion, and the Great Recession essentially just pushed all of those folks who would have been I, mean, I think there's multiple factors, and actually I suggest you read this great paper by Peter Ganami and Jeff Liebman that does 
the best decomposition of the increase in the caseload that I've seen anywhere between how much it was the economy, how much of it was policy change, et cetera. So you can kind of get a sense of it, kind of what's going on. Um, so a couple of other suggestions. I was a little surprised that in the PSID, why didn't you test your prediction model in the PSID? Because you, you observe the three groups, that would be the first thing to do. I guess we wanted to, I wanted to see, once I put it in the food apps, how well it was doing. Well, oh, but that's not what we need to know, right? So I, I, oh, the first step would at least show what your model fit oh, is within well, sample. We literally just take this. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. we, we did that. Our RC proved yeah. yeah. they looked fantastic. Right? The, the, okay. The higher the point. Because I was totally <laughs> shocked by your results. I mean, there are a million people have looked at non recipients to recipients, and basically there's incredible observables and unobservables that make the recipients much worse off looking. And so I, it almost like honestly doesn't pass the smell test that they're so similar to the non-recipients. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know if it's what you're controlling for and you're doing a better job than, than usual models, but I, I think it's worth, I don't know, looking into that a little bit more. And then the third suggestion I had was the PSID has some of these health outcomes. It asks about self-reported health status, <coughs> get BMI, you get that for the parents and the kids. Yeah. So I would think it would be interesting to do a little bit of cross, that's, that's uh, cross uh, not just the food expenditures, but some of the health measures to, mm -hmm. to see that the results are consistent. Yeah, really interesting. Mm -hmm. Does PSI do you have any savings information? Mm -hmm. They ask you every five years about your wealth. And maybe this new I'm the new expert on PSR. Right. The level of savings. Which would actually potentially change their demand behavior. Yeah. I mean, I mean, every time you think about this, the PSI is more, I was, just, I was mm -hmm. thinking about using it as just a. Mm -hmm. we, we certainly brought it in when we discovered that the food apps didn't have them. But the, the reason why I was thinking that is because you've got this prediction problem in the food apps. Mm -hmm. It would be certainly in, encouraging to know that the same patterns for the variables you've been observing both mm -hmm. hold up. Right. That could, not, not because it's the best data, right. but because it allows you to do a bit of a crosswalk. Yeah, it's really <laughs> The problem is you're, you're actually using a lot of the data that overlap across the two to do the prediction itself. Yeah. So you can't use those. So you have to use some other kind of things. And you're not trying to throw out data to make that. You're trying to do the best that you can. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Are you the savings in food is kind of validated in a different data? What about like something like that? So if you measure, you know, something like that, you can validate the data. I can get, I mean, for sure I can apply the prediction to yeah. the other data sets in the data. Does not, I don't think the NEPS has some of the outcomes yes. I, I can. Yeah. Um, it has SNAP? Yeah. Sure. I mean, I can still use the SIP. And that, 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 small What? What small number? We might not yeah. have like number of cars and sort of all the Yeah, it's, I think it's, it's a, I mean, I don't know, now that I have these predictions, I think it's just like, it's a cloud of industry. And instead USDA special thing where they allow us to get this for validation. You also get a much more standard. Um, but it also doesn't have, the Wilson standard doesn't have the demographic study mm -hmm. attached to it like the free access. It has to be sort of unique.
wanted to know how much your lasso improved its program over the last five years. <laughs> <laughs> Vastly, of course, I've got them. When we do a loge, I frankly, it, look, it doesn't, as far as like the final outcome, it looks in many ways similar to what I reported. Uh, so uh, the, the, the main reason for the lasso was, was again, partly I wanted to learn the method, and, and partly I also because I wanted to, uh, I, I really don't know what the right functional form is. Right, so just sticking in, it felt wrong just sticking in 10, 10 predictors. But, uh, yeah. It was cool. Yeah.